today on the Perception in Action podcast. Do we really need to use decomposition, prescription, and repetition to drill the fundamentals first before we move into a more representative game-like context? A direct comparison of drills and the CLA. So it's time for a call to action. Hi, this is Rob Gray from Arizona State University. I've been on a now over 25-year journey as a researcher, professor, and high-performance consultant to understand how we acquire and adapt our perceptual motor skills. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. Now on to the show. Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray from ASU and the Perception Action podcast, back with another article review. In today's episode, what I want to tackle is this, the common bugaboo we have about the fundamentals of skill. And the idea, I think I've expressed this before, I have a lot of coaches that accept, oh, they really like variability, self-organization, exploration, and movement skills after they teach you the fundamentals, right? How can we possibly let a soccer player play a small side of game before we teach them to dribble or pass, right? We need to teach the fundamentals typically in a very isolated decompose, repetitive, prescriptive way first, get that down, and then we can move them up to more these more realistic, representative environments. We're going to plug that basic skill into those representative environments. That's an idea that is really strong and it's hard to get rid of. A lot of people really, really still believe that. So what we want to do in this, this paper is going to challenge this idea. And this paper is going to look at soccer. Um, it's called Train As You Play, Improving Effectiveness of Training in Youth Soccer Players by Dukar et al. Yi Chow, former guest on the podcast, one of the authors of the course uh, known for nonlinear pedagogy. Right. So this is this is this paper. So let's have a look. OK, so kind of a background, right? Research on you typically coming from a cognitive psychology information processing perspective is the idea that you have to build up these motor programs of the fundamentals first, right? And then you can plug them into the game, right? And deliberate, that goes, goes, goes along with um, Erickson's idea of deliberate practice, right? You, you identify what's involved in the skill, what the ideal technique is. And you train to develop those, right? So, so we need to isolate um, the skills so we can develop these automatic motor programs before we actually play the game. Okay, um, this you know has c- creates this kind of asymmetry that we've talked about a lot, right? Where the coach knows all the answers, right? The coach knows the correct technique. The coach knows the fundamentals you need to learn, and they're going to prescribe them, feedback, correct, so on. Okay, and so these are all driven by cognitive theories. Also, a common thing you still hear now, this is really consistent with cognitive load theory, right? We need to make everything easier for you because your processing capacity is limited. Your attention is limited. Your working memory is limited. We can't throw you in a game right away until you learn these fundamentals, right? And this has led to this kind of dualistic um, tradition in, in sports coaching, which we commonly call traditional coaching that some people get mad at that we use that term, but I don't know how you can't see that that's there. Okay. So this is this persistent idea of the fundamentals. There's a certain set of movement skills you need to learn first in isolation, decoupling, prescription, etc. Then we're going to plug them into the game. Okay. That's this persistent idea that's going to be challenged in this paper, right? So we're going to do a decontextualized practice phase to acquire these technical skills, these techniques. Only later can we put them in, once we have those down, can we get them into the game and learn decision-making skills. And you still see this, right? You know, and and this is, I don't, this is not a straw man or characterization from my experience. You typically see a session where 90% of the session is focused on repetition of some desired technique or form. Right, I talk about tennis practice. I always see I've seen soccer, basketball, where the first part of a football practice, where all of it, the first part of it, 45 minutes of an hour practice is desoted, is repetition of some technique isolated out of the game, no opponents, right? Let's get this technique. And then only the last 10, 15 minutes do they actually get to play against an opponent, if that, right? And there's this hope that this, what we, developed in this isolated, out-of-context, unrepresentative training will transfer 
into a game context. There's no real evidence to show that it does, but we have this kind of consistent, persistent belief that it will. Okay. Um, we also see this, you know, the, um, you know, coaches in soccer and other sports are starting to introduce small side and condition games, right, to start. But they're not, they don't seem to, instead of taking that and replacing the isolated, decontextualized, repetitive practice with small sided games, which can achieve the same thing, they just add it on, right? So they're not taking out, they're not reducing the amount of time done in this isolated product, okay? Um, so that's kind of a, a, a thing, okay? So that's, this is, so this is the thing that they want to challenge in the, stu in the study, right? We're getting some. Right, so what they're going to do is they're going to uh, uh, m compare the traditional sequence where you learn the fundamentals in an isolated way and then play with a, a nonlinear pedagogy approach, basically a, cons a constraint side approach where you, you're going to play small-sided games designed to develop some of the basic skills, right? And then, uh, you know, we're going to have much more... Um, um, kind of representative and what they're going to do that's kind of unique in the study right so one of the things when you in this most of these studies where you compare an ecological approach to a traditional approach right where you expect an ecological approach to shine is in highly variable game-like conditions right because you're being developing an adaptable decision maker you know it's going to transfer that's where you expect to see the biggest difference so typically in studies and my studies too right we test people in more representative conditions, right? So we test them in very representative conditions with lots of things going on, lots of variation in pitch speed in my baseball studies and things like that, because that's where we expect to see the big difference. This study is actually taking the opposite approach. It's going to stack the deck in favor of the traditional approach. What it's going to do is going to, it's going to compare the effect of nonlinear pedagogy and traditional approach for very isolated tests. So typical tests you would use to test dribbling, passing, and so on, lateral movement. So what they're gonna, in the pre and post, before and after training, they're going to do dribbling around cones and timing, right? So they're going to use very unrepresentative measures that are in favor of, of the isolate that are very similar to the isolated training to 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 see this, right? So what they're going to what they want to see is can the nonlinear pedagogy approach, constraints that approach, still be effective? even when you're testing and measuring in a non-representative environment and using non-representative tests, which we do eventually want to move away from, hopefully. Okay, so in the study, they had three, group, three groups, one control group and two, two treatment groups. They called the play and practice. The practice is the traditional, isolated, um, repetitive, prescriptive coaching. Play is small-sided games. Uh, there are 40 players from a German amateur amateur soccer club uh, around average 10 years. Okay, there was a little bit of a thing. It's not that big a deal, but a methodological issue is that they decided to use. They had th did the t they took them from teams that were playing at different levels. They took the first team was all the control group, right? So that was the control group. The control group was actually a higher playing at a higher level than the rest of the other two, right? Which it's problematic in a way because, right, you wouldn't expect the control group to show much training benefits. There are high as much training benefits just from the start because they're at a higher level, right? You don't you have smaller gains, um, but so there's got like a confound between skill level and training group. Okay, but but at least they assigned that to the control group and not one of the other ones. Um, but they so they split the remaining players into fourteen players in the play and fourteen in the practice. Okay. Um, all groups went, we did standardized out of context, pass dribble and changes direction testing. So they had to do dribbling around cones, passing to a certain things. Um, and, and they did this post training, uh, and uh, after a five week retention period, right? So the deck is stacked towards traditional isolated training. Cause that's what we're going to actually measure your performance under those conditions. If we believe that's effective, if we follow the specificity of practice idea, then you should be better in, after traditional training because that's what you're being tested in. Very, very similar to what you practiced in. Okay? So the deck is stacked against the CLA or ecological approach in this one, it looks like to me. Um, so what did, what did the training do? So the first group, the practice do, did decompose training. So they, they, did re they practiced the regular training um, the control group just did the regular training, um, the, the amount seven, uh, seven sessions over five weeks. 
um, 30 minutes of regular, they did it 30 minutes at the start of training, right? Um, the, the practice group did a lot of drills, right? Dribbling around cones, passing. Um, they were given explicit instruction about the best technique. Uh, they were, the practice was designed to get you to develop this technique. Um, the coach picked the task. They gave them feedback, corrective feedback, and so on. So very traditional coaching. Um, here's some of the examples of the, the exercises the coaches could pick from, right? So dribbling around a course, cone of, a course of cones to get your, your ball handling skills, uh, dribbling, adding a passing component to the course cones to get your passing skills and so on, right? So very, I don't need to go on a lot of detail, very what you almost always see on, on tr traditional soccer practice, right? So drilling, basically drills, and okay? that's, that's what was in the practice group. The play group followed the key principles of nonlinear pedagogy, small sided and conditioned games. So they didn't do any of the cones or any of that. Uh, they they were they had a bunch. They manipulated the constraints, right? Um, they talked about they manipulated the instruction or the goal of the practice activity. So maintain possession, play over, through, or around your opponent, try to score. So they had different um, and for different activities, they had different goals. Uh, they had different rules. They gave they scored possession versus scoring a goal. Um, they varied that so to change kind of the the task constraints. They also changed the field size to create more pressure. The number of balls at most three. Um, they needed to they explain the area. They had to change and made it neutral players. Um, th so they had a lot of different constraints manipulations they did right to to and and they're kind of targeted at developing the skills, but. No repetitive, no talk about technique or form or, you know, anything like that. So cl classic CLA in terms of small side games. So what did they find? First off, right, I should point out what we're, what we're essentially looking for here, unlike a lot of the other studies we've done, we're, because we're measuring in an unrepresentative way. So we're measuring your, your speed dribbling around a course is our test before and after. What we want, what we're expecting to see is really no difference, right? We, what, were they, uh, uh, what they want to show here is that training in the CLA and doing small side games is equally effective for developing these fundamentals as doing the isolated practice. And that's really what they found. So um, terms, here's the overall results, right? Here's the time needed to complete the course, um, passing, uh, you know, for pre-test, uh, a uh, post test for the the play group retention right so they're very very similar so there were no significant mostly most of, for the most part there were no significant differences between the group people learned the fundamentals of handling the ball and passing and lateral movement and change of direction equally well if they did isolated repetitive practice focused on that versus playing small side games that was manipulation of constraints designed to develop that okay there was some evidence within the passing skills that the the they got poor retention in the practice group, the traditional group, right? So here, here's the control group, the red. Uh, the traditional groups gets better, and then retention they get worse, right? So um, whereas the play group, the CLA group, is continuing to get a little bit better. So there's some evidence, not very strong, some evidence of that that there's better retention is what, of course, what you expect to, to find, right? So what they're basically showing is the, the three groups are the same. As I said, you wouldn't expect this because you wouldn't expect the CLA to really shine here because we're not really testing under conditions, right, that it's benefit. What we're showing here is that it's equally good at developing the quote-unquote fundamentals of soccer, right, as all the traditional methods. If we now did a game test where you had to decide, you had to make decisions, you had to pass, you were in, a, you would then you would expect this group to be the CLA group to be much better. So it has the core teaching the fundamentals and all these other positive things, which has been shown in tons of other studies, right? That that shown, right? So the um, so overall, the originality of the studies that they're, as I said, they're stacking the deck towards the traditional approach by testing technical skills in a very unrepresentative way dribbling around courses, repeating. So if anything, you know, you would, you would expect the isolated group should be better because they're testing in the same conditions they practice under, but they're not. Um, they also, what they did was they looked at, in the practice, the number of opportunities participants had to repeat the same movements. Um, and what they found was it was less in the small-sided condition games, of course, not surprisingly. Um, 
And so they, they're really challenging the, the idea that you need a certain number of reps, the deliberate practice, right? You need to develop the fundamentals, right? What they showed is variability seems to be more important than a certain number of reps, okay? Um, the, um, so some evidence in the retention effects I'm going on here. Um, so they had, you know, the greater variability seems to be more important than, than strict repetition, right? So I think pretty positive uh, uh, support for the idea that, you know, this is something I try. We can, you can get the fundamentals in a representative practice, right? Um, it doesn't mean that the representative practice has to overwhelm the person, right? This is not another common thing I hear. Well, well, if I, I'm just going to, if there are too many things going on, that cognitive load, right? What we want to go for is simplification, not decomposition, right? Reduce the number of players, the number of options, right? And then you, you can make it easier for a new learner so it doesn't overwhelm them. But having them in the representative effect design, right, is going to have many, many benefits as shown in other studies, but at the same time seems to be developed these fo magical fundamentals we seem to be looking for. So I think this is pretty convincing evidence. Um, so it's defining state in that even a so-called technical skill, right? So the, uh, uh, as commonly shown, you know, commonly put forth in this is we need to develop technical skills, then tactical skills, right? Here we're showing we can develop them at the same time, okay? Can be you know, by not, it's more effective. There's, you know, through the, the retention effects, it might be even more effective. Uh, consequently, study provides further evidence for the possible advantages of nonlinear training and skill acquisition. It aims to encourage coaches to design training to afford players to train as they play. Representative design, right? You can still get the basics in a representative practice environment if you design it correctly. That's the take-home message of this. I should also point out, right, this is another study I'm going to add to my list of studies that have made direct comparisons between an ecological approach and a more traditional approach, which you can find at perceptionaction.com forward slash comparative, right? I think there's now, how many? Um, so I'm going to add, I think there's 16. I'm going to add it to this one um, that have shown uh, benefits, right? This is, from what I can tell, my this is a second study that has shown um, this kind of idea that you can develop the basics of a pattern of movement, the fundamentals, um, equally as well while exploring, right? Now there's, this was shown in a weightlifting study, very similar effect to the soccer study. So I think we need to move away from the idea of that we need to, we have to develop the fundamentals by drilling. There's just not evidence to support that. And that the evidence that's going to transfer into making good decisions is not well supported either. Right. So here, I think this is a really, you know, for the most part, a very well done study that I said stacked the deck towards the traditional approach and still didn't find any difference. OK, that's it for today's episode. Remember, you can contact me at Rob Gray at ASU.edu or follow me on Twitter at Shakeyweights. To find out more about the podcast, please check out PerceptionAction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including a monthly coaches meetup, please head over to Patreon.com forward slash Perception Action. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now, and keep them coupled.